Hey, how's it going guys? It's Nate here. And the world Fallout 4 takes us to is a very different one from the one that we left behind. I suppose Total Atomic Annihilation will do that to a place. But three years later, I think it's safe to say most players have become quite familiar with it. I mean, that's more than enough time to become acquainted with pretty much everything this wasteland offers. Or... Is it? Because even after all this time, there may still be a handful of side activities or alternative quest options and dialogue opportunities that many a sole survivor have left undiscovered. And today we're going to explore just a few of them, as we dive into five more things you probably never knew you could do in Fallout 4. Starting off, Parker Quinn is an interesting fellow who can be found at a ruined street corner south of the South Boston Police Department. When approached, Quinn will immediately make an effort to get the player's attention, before going into what is essentially a sales pitch. He makes a grand statement against the impracticality of caps and their uselessness, and then attempts to sell the player what he offers as an alternative, the charge card. For 110 caps, he'll give you a charge card, which he claims is worth 100 caps at any vendor in the Commonwealth. The extra 10 caps are his service fee. He confidently asserts that this is the currency of the future, and will allow you to finally make transactions without hauling pounds and pounds of aluminum around at all times. It's super simple. You give me 110 caps right now, and I give you this charge card. Accept it at any store in the Commonwealth, up to 100 caps. Now, it's fairly obvious right from the get-go that Parker is a scam artist. His entire pitch and demeanor reek of snake oil salesman. And even then, if you agree to buy his product, he'll whisper an insult under his breath right afterwards. Attempting to redeem your charge card at any stores later on will just result in the merchants laughing at you and demanding that caps be paid. So it's clear we've been duped. You take this charge card? Trying to pull a fast one on me? No. Caps. Only. However, if the Far Harbor DLC has been installed, something very odd can come of your purchase. If you head to Far Harbor with the charge card in your inventory, and speak with Brooks, the owner of the bait shop on the docks, a dialogue option will be available for you to ask him about it. And hilariously enough, Brooks will actually redeem your charge card and give you 100 caps back. Hey, this is a long shot, but um... Do you accept this charge card? Huh? Oh yeah, that thing. Sure do. It'll be easier if I just cash you out. Looks like, what, 100 caps? Here you go. You did pay 110, but at least you got most of your money again. Now, something to note here is that Parker Quinn boasts a very strong New England accent, as do the folks we meet in the Far Harbor settlement. So it's very possible that Bethesda may be suggesting a bit of a link there. Regardless, it's odd to think that Mr. Quinn may not have been so deceitful after all. At least, not entirely. Next on our list, the quest, Dangerous Minds, occurs shortly after the player has killed Kellogg. In it, you and Nick Valentine visit the Memory Den in Good Neighbor, where you enter a machine and are able to go through some of Kellogg's old memories, thanks to a chip in his brain that you are able to recover. It's one of Fallout 4's more unique missions, and offers quite a bit of perspective on who Kellogg was and what his motivations were almost making you a bit sympathetic to the character. One of the memories we get to go through was his experience working with the Institute breaking into Vault 111 and kidnapping Sean. We're able to hear his thoughts on the matter, where he expresses disdain for needing to murder your spouse to death, and some regret for helping the organization, before moving on to the next memory. Ultimately, we end up learning about a curious man named Virgil who Kellogg had some association with, before waking up and being sent after him completing the quest. However, did you know that it's actually possible to head straight over to the Memory Den right after being released from Vault 111, before meeting Nick or going to Diamond City, or even saving Preston? If you do this and either pass a speech check or pay 100 caps, Irma will allow you to use one of the memory loungers to relive one of your own memories. This memory will always be the kidnapping of Sean, the same one we experienced through Kellogg's mind in the quest. However, it will yield some considerable differences. The vault will be much darker. The names of Kellogg and the Institute scientists will be replaced with mysterious figures. And rather than listen to Kellogg's own commentary, we'll get to hear our character's interpretation of events, which obviously isn't very positive. Soon after Sean is taken, we'll be awoken by the Memory Den staff, who will apologize for making us go through those events again. 
Irma will be especially sorry about you losing Sean, but will direct you to Diamond City to find Nick Valentine, who she thinks may be of some assistance. Now, this entire quest becomes completely unavailable very early on in the game. As soon as Nick is rescued, you can no longer begin this specific quest. And for most people, rescuing Nick comes long before your first visit to Good Neighbor anyway. Normally, we're sent to Diamond City after the detective thanks to the advice of Mama Murphy, but this is an alternative way to be given that same objective. Furthermore, when you do come back to the memory den with Nick later in the game, Irma and her staff will have some special things to say related to your earlier visit. So, next time you're looking to relive perhaps the most traumatic experience imaginable, know that you can! For third spot, the Silver Shroud is a side quest offered by Kent Cannoli in Good Neighbor, where he sends you on a mission to assume the identity of a fictional pre-war superhero known as the Silver Shroud. Evidently, before humanity brought itself to the brink of extinction, the Shroud was a comic book and radio icon, a mysterious trench coat donning, fedora wearing, scarf boasting vigilante who fought crime. In Kent's quest, it'll be your duty to put on his costume and recreate his lifestyle, becoming the scorch of Good Neighbor's gangs. Well, with the addition of the Automatron DLC, another comic book parody character will find themselves in the Commonwealth, as someone calling themselves The Mechanist will unleash a robotic terror upon the wasteland. Here's where it gets kind of neat, though. If when you finally confront the Mechanist towards the end of the Automatron questline, you're wearing that Silver Shroud costume and have already completed Kent's missions, you'll have some otherwise hidden dialogue options with the villain that allow the two of you to speak in character towards each other. Take a listen. <laughs> the Silver Shroud. I cannot believe someone so respected, so honorable, would come here and destroy my robots. Your reign of terror ends here, Shroud. The Shroud, as always, walks the path of justice. It is you who has fallen, Mechanist. Lies, Shroud. Lies. The Commonwealth has suffered more than its fair share of injustices because of you. Now you'll face the full might of the Mechanist. My righteous robots will end your tyranny once and for all. For fourth spot, this one's less of something you yourself have total control of, and more of a world interaction that can happen to you if you're rolling with the right follower at the right time and don't mess up. When wandering the Commonwealth, one of the most common random encounters you'll be subject to is a simple raider attack. Some raiders will spawn in, try to overpower you, and typically fail. Then you'll get some free loot out of it too. But if Nick Valentine is your companion when one of these ambushes occurs, there's an ever so small chance that a world interaction may be triggered, where one of the raiders recognizes the synthetic detective and orders his men to stand down and let you guys go on your way. Cease fire! It's Nick! Stop! It's Nick Valentine! Nick, Jesus. If I'd known it was you from the start, I'd never have jumped you like that. Oh yeah, don't don't mention it. Just glad to see you made something of yourself, I suppose. I <laughs> think we're just gonna go. I owe you. Big time. Whatever you need, it's yours. It's critical that as soon as you hear these raiders start speaking, you stop fighting as well, as otherwise the dialogue sequence will be interrupted, and the raiders will just go back to being hostile. Oftentimes, if you're not paying attention and just keep combat going, you won't even notice what these raiders were doing, and will have completely missed the opportunity. So, if you're ever wandering about with Nick at your side again, and spot some raiders off in the distance, maybe it's a good idea to not try to stealth defeat them at 300 yards away, and just meet them head on. It could lead to an interesting reunion. And finally, last on our list, speaking of raiders, Jared is the leader of a gang held up in the ruins of the old Corvega assembly plant in Lexington. You may be sent to take him down during a number of radiant quests, but overall he doesn't seem to be an incredibly significant fellow. However, his terminal has some entries with a few interesting quirks. You see, depending on which other raider gangs you've wiped out before meeting him, Jared will have specific entries that mention those gangs getting destroyed by you. Say, for example, you took out Slag, leader of the Forged operating out of Sagus Ironworks. If that's the case, then Jared will have a file saying, quote, Someone snubbed out Slag and the Forged. Word's hazy on who did the deed, but it sounds like an outside party, not a rival gang. They're a new player in the Commonwealth? Question mark? Likewise, taking out Tower Tom and his faction at the Beantown Brewery nets the following document. Quote, 
Seems someone waltzed into the Beantown Brewery and put Tom and his entire gang in the dirt. Was about time we posted some extra guards anyway. You can read about your own exploits. Furthermore, in that same vein, though perhaps a bit more well-known, it's also possible to listen to raiders radiantly talk about you after you've taken out another gang. Hear about Beantown Brewery? Seems Tower Tom and his people got the axe. Yep, rumor is no survivors. Yeah, well if someone's wiping out gangs, we all need to stay sharp. It would seem the sole survivor has the chance to build quite a reputation for themselves amongst the gangs of the Commonwealth. And with that, we are going to wrap up. Five more things you probably never knew you could do in Fallout 4. Thanks for stopping by, everybody. Which of what we went over did you find to be your own personal favorites? And what alternative quest options or side activities in the Commonwealth do you know of that we didn't tackle today? Leave a comment down below. As always, like ratings are very much appreciated. Again, thanks for watching, and hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everyone.